Hi, everyone. My name is Alex, and this is Tank Tested. And today on Aquarium with Strangers, I am joined by a special guest, a man that I met in Seattle, uh, who is the owner of Aquarium Zen, an amazing aquarium and aquascaping shop uh, in downtown Seattle. His name is Steve, and uh, he's with us now. So how are you doing tonight? Hey, Alex. I'm doing great. It's a sunny day here in Seattle, which is uh, kind of extraordinary. You know, you can't complain. Yeah. Nice, nice little like perks of everything. Yeah. So yeah. Trying to find uh, the silver lining through all this. <laughs> right. So you're at home right now. You're not at the shop. I'm, well, I'm taking a break from the shop. We are open for like curbside services, phone orders. We're not having people in the store at the moment, but that might change at the end of the month. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to just let everyone else know uh, behind me uh, is my 150. It's covered up with a sheet because it is skaped, but I want you guys to not see it until a video goes live on it. And uh, I think a lot of what's in that skate is in part inspired by what I saw at Aquarium Zen uh, when I visited about a year ago. Uh, the cube tank that you let me film was a thing that really inspired me and made me made me really impressed with how you can make escape with low tech plants and have it look really really beautiful. So um, I want to give everyone like a little insight into what Aquarium Zen looks like. So I've loaded up this video uh, now. You're uh, you're sitting there, and now we're moving on to a tour of the general shop. But uh, this is a repurposed version of the video that I shot when I visited in uh, last May. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Aquarium Zen? Sure. Aquarium Zen is um, you know, just kind of my brainchild, my baby, uh, a light result of a lifelong interest in aquariums. Um, I, I signed my lease for the space in 2012, and I just loved the, it was, a, it was kind of like this hidden, forgotten um space in you know a little side street that hadn't been rented in many years and just had a lot of charm you know old brick and mortar walls uh, exposed beams really old uh, hardwood floor and so i just saw a lot of potential some skylights i just saw a lot of potential for what i wanted to do which was more like a boutique style aquascaping shop i really wanted to be focused on the nature aquarium concept and be able to offer those products and surfaces to my community. At the time, you know, it was, you couldn't find like rimless aquariums in my local stores. You couldn't find aquarium soil. You know, people were doing everything in a really old model that, um, that wasn't up to date. So I really wanted to feature the cutting edge of the freshwater hobby, which is, in my opinion, you know, the planted aquarium, the aquascaping scene. And I also wanted, um, you know, a space to kind of show off my own creative potential so I can, um, you know, bring in potential clients for installations, maintenance contracts, that sort of thing. So it kind of doubles not only as a retail shop, but kind of like a creative laboratory gallery type space. It's always changing. The uh, displays are always evolving into something new and I really it kind of has an energy of its own it's really fascinating and I just feel like I'm the steward of this creative force running through all these fish tanks and plants and fish and water I don't know it's it's been a wonderful wonderful uh, journey for me yeah I mean one of the things that I was uh most you know inspired by or impressed by in the shop well there are a lot of things but that every one of your tanks is planted in some capacity there's some there's some plant material in all of your tanks as well um, yeah. and then you have a lot of actual like beautiful aquascape set up how much time and effort does it take to maintain the shop aside from like the actual business side of it yeah it's um ongoing um so we're i don't differentiate one of my one of my goals was to sh keep people involved in the process not only to encourage them, but to, you know, show it firsthand, right? This is some, when you, it's kind of rare that you have an aquascaping shop. So I wanted, I wanted people to really see what was involved. So we're doing, we're doing maintenance constantly. So even on a busy Saturday, we're doing water changes and there's hoses running around. It's kind of chaotic, but also fun. You know, people are seeing the behind the scenes in front of the scenes as it's happening. 
And uh, so we're constantly doing maintenance during business hours even. And uh, I've gotten some criticism for it, but mostly I think it's good. I think it shows people, uh, especially people that are new to it, that there is a lot of maintenance involved and they get to see firsthand what I'm doing. They can ask questions when I'm working. I hold a lot of workshops on the weekends. So it's very much like a, a in-person actual experience because most of what's available for the aquascaping community is online service by online vendors and, and that sort of thing. So I really wanted to emphasize the actual, you know, uh, the actual experience. And so that's yeah. what we're all about. So, I mean, knowing that, knowing that you're, you're very much a brick and mortar shop by design, um, given that Seattle and most of the country is kind of locked down, how are you as a business adapting to that? And how are you, how are yeah. you adjusting? So again, that's part of my own personal evolution <laughs> uh, because my model is totally a failure <laughs> in this in this climate so uh, the current climate so I'm trying to come to grips with that um, I uh, I've been blessed that I've been supported I'll say thank you to my to any of my customers that are watching supported over their years you know in, in this sort of brick and mortar model um, but yeah it's really obviously if we were able to ship we would have a more robust income stream. So we're just open for curbside phone phone in orders. Uh, luckily, I do have a lot of regulars who've been supporting me through this. Our sales are down like 80, 90 percent, but it's wow. enough to pay the rent and you know pay some bills. And that's all I could really ask for at this time. We're all I'm sure everyone's taking an economic hit. And um, so I'm no different. Uh, luckily, I do have some financial reserves to draw my personal finances from but the store itself is basically covering its its bottom line you know through the minimal sales that we're doing but that said we are actively pursuing getting a little online store going where we could start shipping things out especially plants i've been wanting to do this for years so this kind of feels like a catalytic moment you know where we're where our the old is being tested with the new paradigm and we have to adapt to it or die <laughs> yeah. so we're going to you know we're, we're working on getting a little online store so we can start offering um, plants. And, and also I've been branching out into doing more educational stuff. I've been doing live streams on Instagram. That's been really fun. Yeah, I've really enjoyed watching the, the, the live streams. I mean, it's something that I, so I get a lot of comments of people saying that my channel is very relaxing. And then I also get a lot of comments of people saying that my voice is terrible and they hate it. <laughs> um, which is great. It's very supportive. It's YouTube. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that your live streams kind of have that same ethos of it's a very relaxing space oh, to visit. So okay. uh, if you like this channel, I hope you go follow Aquarium Zen on Instagram so you can follow those streams. Um, so where can people follow you? Because once you get your online store yeah. up and running, where can people find you? Well, we have a website, aquariumzen.net, but I would say I'm most active, like the, you know, up to date, minute by minute changes for my store. Um, Cause I'm just, we're literally just taking this a day at a time. I keep changing my um, hour structure. It's been hard um, as this unfolds. So Instagram has really been my go-to for broadcasting, you know, all our recent updates. So if you want to follow us on Instagram, I'd say that's probably the most effective way to connect with us. And as we develop, you know, like these online, the the online sales, the the mail order stuff, then you'll you'll be the first to know about it. And then that way you could also stay in contact with me when I um, change my when I update my live stream schedule. For instance, tomorrow night, eight o'clock Seattle time, I will be doing a live stream on um, how do you mitigate you know, when an aquascape just has a massive algae bloom and just kind of goes off the rails, what do you do in that, the, in that case? So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that one. one Cause What's that? I mean, I'm excited for that one right now. This tank is in great shape, but it's a new tank. I literally added the plants Sunday. So, uh -huh. you know, who knows when it goes off the rails. Exactly. So I think that's an important one. Luckily, one of my tank, luckily or unluckily, um, try to turn the, flip the negative into a positive. Um, the, one of my tanks just blew up with algae. It looks horrible. 
So mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about what I think went wrong and then what I'm going to do to try to bring it back into shape and bring it back into order. So I think it'll be yeah. very instructive actually, because that's all we do is battle algae, right? That's our nemesis. And so yeah. I can tell people my 40, believe it or not, I've been doing this for 40 years, 40 years experience, you know, dealing with algae, how I would uh, tackle it, what my approach would be. And so I think it's going to be a good live stream. I try to keep it front, fun and informal. So it's more like we're interacting much like you would be in my store with me. And I'm going to add uh, a link to your Instagram in the chat. Um, I hope that, oh no, sorry everyone. Um, I hope that everyone uh, goes and visits you. And uh, we Yeah, can, we're just we can... Aquarium Zen at Instagram. Yeah, so uh, for everyone that's sticking around, this isn't just gonna be a recap of a video that you've already seen. Uh, I was lucky enough to spend a whole day in Aquarium Zen, and there's video that I've shot that I've never actually shared with you all. Now, those videos, a polished version of them are gonna come out eventually, uh, but for now, um, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of preview. Uh, and just to, to highlight where we're going with this, we'll look at a jungle-style tank. I'm calling it a jungle-style tank. Does that feel descriptive or right to you, or yeah, how would you describe um, it? That's fine with me. I, I would consider it more like a wild um, wild pond is what my concept was for that tank. Yeah, but, so this um, is the tank that we're talking about, this yeah, wild. Yeah, so it's a, it started out as a very, like, as, as often does with my aquascapes in the store, they start out very detailed and have a very precise um, uh, concept. And then as I get busy and have to juggle all the things I need to juggle with running my business and, and customer service and everything, it tends to take on its own destiny that Aquascape does. And then I'm more, it's more like this dance with the chaos that kind of threatens the whole environment. And then me trying to control that into some aesthetic form. So I started with this tank, it looked very different at the beginning as these two mountain structures. There's two rock, two big Unzan stone in there um, that were covered in moss and had a very nice kind of, um, kind of control feel. But as time went on, it got pretty wild. And uh, at that time, I was also inspired by some of the pond style aquariums I've seen people make. And so I let a lot of the plants grow out, the emerge, you know, come out the surface, a lot of emergent growth. And, yeah, and in, in, this, in the video stream, you'll start to see some of that. So this is all yeah. footage that we've I've never shown, um, but I've got so much of it. I spent probably two hours filming this tank in no I small part because I really love like the brick background with yeah. the green, like it just works as a beautiful piece of art. I think you did a great job filming that one actually. The, f the footage you showed me was awesome. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. So um, uh, when I visited, this was a year ago, uh, how is the, is this tank still set up in your shop? It's, it is, I, I actually, in the, you know, since we've been under quarantine, um, I've been spending a lot more time at home and not really maintaining the aquascapes with the same level of precision. So I let this one get away from me, which was kind of intentional. I'm mm -hmm. kind of in like a triage mode where I'm just, you know, taking care of the things I can take care of, primarily myself. Um, that's the main thing. <laughs> I need yeah. to survive this pandemic for Aquarium Zen to move forward. And uh, Aquascapes last. This one I've been wanting to redo for a while now. Um, I think when you filmed it, it had, it had already been up for like two years. So it's definitely over, overdue for a reboot. And I've been getting more into, I wouldn't even call them aquascapes. It's just more like, it could be jungle style, just like very vivid plantings. You know, even plants have bigger leaves. Like when we aquascape, we tend to scale everything down and mm -hmm. miniaturize, make, make choices on um, leaf shapes and sizes that will give our tanks a, a much bigger impression. And I've been kind of doing the opposite. I've been growing sword plants and big hygrophilas and that sort of thing. So I've been kind of, for some reason, attracted to just going more colorful, bigger. So that's probably going to be the direction I go with this tank when I reboot it. But right now it's really wild. It's totally overgrown. And, yeah, so um, you, you said that it's been, it's been up, I guess it's now been up for three years. Yeah, so, so it's really time to yeah, restart when, it. When people are thinking of setting up an aquascape, uh, what is the like, the lifespan and life cycle that they should be expecting. 
That's a good question. I would say it's, you know, it's kind of hard to generalize because, you know, every style is so different. But I would say it starts really if you have a CO2 injected environment and good light, you know, all the caveats that you're taking care of CO2, good lighting, fertilizers, all that. I would say it really starts gelling, hitting its stride around six months. Um, about a month in, it'll start looking okay. But around six months is kind of the sweet spot. I would say six months to a year and a half. And then usually I'll start to feel like there's some decline at like a year, a year and a half. So it really, but it, like I said, it depends. I've had some, if a low light system, for example, those are, it's almost like you're gardening with plastic plants. So they could stay like that mm -hmm. forever, really, if you want to. But these faster growing systems, they change so quickly from week to week that they almost feel like a, I, I, I look at it like a metabolic rate. You know, it's like some organisms, they have really high metabolism and they burn out quicker. Others have lower metabolism. So it's like, again, like the tortoise versus the hare or something. And um, so that's kind of the way I look at it. So when I, when I set up a tank like the one we're looking at, it's, you know, that's definitely one I'm thinking, well, it's probably have, going to have a limited lifespan, which in my experience would probably be about two years max. So this one's oh. overdue for sure. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, when you talk about like, that it's it's overdue that it's 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 decline uh can you expand on like what about it is causing that decline and before you do um i just want to acknowledge the chat um so if you have any questions uh leave them in the chat um it's rare that we get uh someone that owns a shop that can actually like answer questions the way that you would if you were able to actually go to the shop in person so uh if you've got questions please leave them in the chat so how what is the driving force of the decline of an aquascape? Well, you know, what, what happens in my mind, first of all, we, the, what, how we anchor our, the ecosystem that we're creating is in our soil ecosystem. So I use Aquasoil, the Amazonia ADA product. That's the soil of my choice. And it just starts getting funky over time. You know, you, we're never... Uh, gravel vacuuming aqua soil, for example. So there's a constant mm -hmm. rain of inputs of food and waste and decaying plant matter. It's only like two, three inches deep. And um, the integrity of the, the grain size, the grains tend to start breaking down to a mud. So it's really, I think, I think it's the soil that determines the lifespan of these things. And ADA has come up with a series of products that supposedly enriches the, the, um, the ecosystem community. I call it an ecosystem community because when we're talking about soil, we're really talking about the not only the physical aspect and the nutrient aspect, but it's a, a bed of bacteria. Right. And bacteria really are what feed um, plant roots. There's an excellent book on a subject called Teeming with Microbes. And it's more geared to, you know, like uh, terrestrial gardeners. People are actually, you know, growing their own food or whatever, but it's really fascinating insight into what's happening in the soil bed. So I think of the, the ecosystem that we're establishing in the aquarium and the soil really is the lifespan determiner, because when that mm. starts to go off, I'll start seeing blooms of cyanobacteria, start having blooms of other weird algaes. Plants just don't grow at the same, uh, same vigor. Some certain species will die off. So I, you know, I could, if I really wanted to, I could, if, you know, if I was really had, you know, a lot of ties to the aquascape itself is just something about it was amazing. I could reinvigorate that soil ecosystem and probably revive it, but I'm just ready for a whole new look altogether. So I usually take that opportunity just to change out everything. But yeah, I think it's really the soil that determines the lifespan of these things. So like I've done sand-based systems with just epiphytic plants, like um, Bulbitis and Java Fern, and we'll be seeing more of that when we talk about the Amazon.com tanks. And those could go indefinitely, really, the way the way they're set up. Right, right. And so when you're when you get someone that's new to aquascape and coming into your shop, yeah, what what is your like suggestion of how they go about? Yeah, we often about talk about substrate right from the get go. You know, it's like, are you really going to be dedicated to um, this process because the substrate can 
sometimes throw in some monkey wrenches. We'll get mm -hmm. nitrogen blooms, ammonia spikes from the soil initially, and that could be, you know, really hair raising for people. <laughs> you know, you have to do a lot of water changes. There could be algae outbreaks. And if you're brand new to this, that might be too much to handle. However, a low light system with the sand base, it, almost anyone can handle that. And um, so we often talk about what people's uh, commitment level is for, for doing things like water changes and, and that sort of thing right from the get go. So I often, it always, yeah, it's kind of like you're rooted in the earth and then you move upwards is the way I look at it. And mm -hmm. um, so we think about sub, the substrate is usually the first choice I ask my customers to make when, when you know, designing their aquascape. And then, so basically, if, if people want to go with more epiphyte plants like Java fern and uh, Obitus or, or Anubias or something like that, you don't really need the, the aqua soil compared no, to it, if you want to go with a carpet or something it, like that could be a liability too. So that's important to think about. The only reason to use soil ever is if you plan on having a very dense growth of plants, either a carpet or, you know, a combination of carpeting plants and stem plants. It's if you, if you want that lush garden look, then use soil. But if you're looking for something more sparse and more stylistic, you can, you know, get very kind of creative and work with interesting hardscape and have minimal plant arrangements, then you would want a low light, maybe a inert substrate system. It doesn't have to be sand, but gravel or something like that. But yeah, I want to, I want to transition to uh, an image of your bulbitis tank, the tank that has yeah. the immersed growth bulbitis, but I think it speaks exactly to what you're describing. Yeah. And everything we set up at Aquarium Zen was set up with as a as an education piece first and foremost. So I always have a low light system like we're talking about. I have the jungle systems. I have very you know detailed aquascapes and everything in between. So people can kind of pick and choose the model that's going to fit best with them. Yeah, and for so last week we had Ted of Ted's Fish Room on here, and he talked about. Uh, basically filming the local ecosystems of fish in the wild. And cool. he photographed bulbitis in the wild. Nice. Uh, and it was a really, really beautiful setup. And we talked about immersed growth. And we talked about this tank. Uh, and the question that he had was, well, was there any, um, any aquatic growth on the bulbitis or was it just immersed? And my memory was that it was all immersed. But now I'm looking at the photo and there is still aquatic growth as well. Um, so can you, can you share a little bit about like this idea of kind of breaking the, the surface of the tank and having growth above the water line? Cause I think this is something that's really stunning. And it's, yeah. Um, first of all, I would say this might, I'll just say it from the start. This might not be something people can achieve at home. Honestly. Um, mm -hmm. one thing about having an aquarium store is, you know, it's full of water. It's full of evaporation, so it's quite humid. Humid. So I, I would imagine you would need at least about 70, 80% humidity to achieve that look. What I did when I started this aquarium, it was a typical aquascape with most of the focus going you know, below the water, not this uh, immersed bulbitis. And I put one little piece of bulbitis near the surface, and it would occasionally put up a leaf. It was almost like it was testing the environment. Put up a leaf, it would shrivel and die. And eventually it, it started growing these more succulent, bigger mm -hmm. leaves. It's fascinating that you could watch this evolution in the plant. It was almost like it was like figuring out this new space, this new sphere to grow into. And then over the years, it just transformed into this massive plant. And um, yeah, it was it was it's been fun to watch it evolve. And then that became it, that became the sole feature of that tank. There was some some aquatic growth, but once the plant starts growing immersed like that and it, it finds those conditions favorable, it puts most of its energy into growing immersed. I think probably what Ted experienced in nature is that it seems to be more of an immersed plant. Um, right. That seems to be its preferred way to grow. And so for years, it just it functionally stopped growing submerged leaves and put more energy into the immersed growth altogether. Yeah. So um, got some questions for you. So image aquatics asks, 
what's uh, the most, with most of the tanks being staked or planted, when selling fish, is it efficient to catch the fish? So yeah, you've got plants in all of your tanks. How do you actually sell fish with that? Yeah, we just get really good at catching fish. <laughs> uh, that's all I like to say. My employees, uh, they go through a hazing period. They run the gauntlet. One of the hardest things to do in my store <laughs> is catch a mono shrimp because we have this mm -hmm. one tank devoted to mono shrimp, but it's full of plants and they're so fast. We actually don't even sell coolie loaches because coolie loaches are way too hard to catch. And um, I was finding they were slowing down the flow of our operations too much and it just wasn't really worth it. So there's certain things we've learned to avoid. Um, but for the most part, my tanks are not aquascaped. You know, the, the ones we sell fish and plants out of, they do have plant material in them and they look like, can kind of look like a, ecosystem or habitat but they're really more designed for plants and fish to keep coming in and out of but i will say um i used to live in san francisco and uh was raised there and my local fish store was ocean aquarium i know he's been featured a lot on youtube mm -hmm. and his tanks are all aquascaped even the ones he sells fish out of and that's kind of where i got a lot of my inspiration for my store and he, i don't know how he does it but he can catch the fish right out of perfectly aquascape manicured aquariums. I tried that in the beginning. Um, when my first my store was first open, all the tanks were beautifully aquascape. You know, it took me about a year and a half to do the build out up to my opening. And it lasted one weekend and we trashed everything that one weekend. <laughs> so I've never really gone back to the model of trying to have a perfect, you know, vision of an aquascape for every tank. That's really what I wanted to do. I had CO2 running to every tank. It would have been really fun but it just wasn't practical. So you kind of have to find your balance and every store finds their flow. And that's what we've done. So we're we find a balance between it being attractive, but still functional. And yes, it is more work for us for sure. But I just think we get better at fishing. Yeah. So uh, Ted, Ted is actually in the chat, Ted's fish room. Uh, Balbitis was not hey, growing on the shoreline. It was on the rocks out of the flow. So I suspect there must be some obligate requirements for the plant to be in the water to some degree. So, yeah, yeah so the, the roots have to be wet or something, right? Yeah, like, that's my impression. Um, I've seen pictures and it seems like they're growing, they're definitely rooted in the water, below the water. The rhizomes are probably creeping below or just above the water. And uh, so it's definitely in that marginal space, but it was really happy growing that. that. Sadly, I dismantled that tank uh, a few weeks ago and I chopped up the whole bull bite. Some of the the uh, rhizomes were like, I mean, an inch in diameter is crazy. It was like a rope. And it, there's multiple pieces of driftwood. There's probably like 10 pieces of driftwood and it had like just encircled them and intertwined through it and really held the whole thing together as a single cohesive unit. So it's fascinating to watch that kind of those natural processes unfold yeah. in your aquarium if you give it time. I, I mean, a fun project for that's sure. an interesting point because I actually have, I, I had a 60 gallon tall tank that I just had like low light plants in and I had it for years and basically did nothing to it. Um, it was a stable system and I took it down when I got the, the 150 from Custom Aquariums and because um, I just didn't want to have that many tanks in my house. Um, <laughs> and when I pulled out the Anubias, like it was maybe three quarters of an inch thick yeah. the, the rhizome and even like breaking it apart it's just like wow what do i do with this now like it looks so crazy because yeah. I've, the rhizome has gotten so big uh is that a is that a thing that like i guess what you you have a lot of other places that you can put the bulbitis but i imagine you're not planning on selling those that bulbitis that you no. broke down so i I mean, my tanks, not every tank is going to be a showpiece, but they all are habitats or ecosystems in my mind. Mm -hmm. So what I could do is take a big chunk of bulbitis, big chunk of bulbitis rhizome with a few little leaves. It's not pretty. No one would want to buy it, but I could throw that in a tank and it'll instantly relax the fish. They'll think they're in nature, it creates right. habitat structure for them. And I'll use it functionally as just as, you know, like I said, structure, habitat. And it's better than like plastic plants or anything by far, but yeah, it's, it's very wild looking, you know, that's, I think a lot of what we consider aquascaping is very manicured. It's our vision 
of an idealized nature. It's not really what's happening in nature. And so um, what's happening in nature might not be as aesthetically pleasing to people, but it's functional for the fish. I still, mm. I, I, I like that wild feel personally. Uh, one thing I took from studying Takashi Amano's work, who I think most people consider very detailed and precise kind of aquascaping. Can, can you introduce who that is for, for everyone? Oh yeah, Takashi Amano is sort of the, the, the father of um, the modern aquascaping movement, a Japanese landscape photographer. He's really into landscape photography and creating these very detailed aquascapes. And he's, he's the, all of this is his vision really. He came up with the nature aquarium concept, which was basically to meld art and, you know, wild ecosystem processes in the aquarium. So look into Takashi Amano. He's, he's the father of the whole aquascaping movement. But what I learned from him was that we're not trying to replicate nature, really. It's the feel of nature. So, mm -hmm. and that's subject to your own creative interpretation. That's the beauty of it. So if I want to go wild, I can. And, um, you know, whether or not that'll win a contest, that's a different story. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate kind of the more wild, jungly, chaotic feel. And that's just because I have spent a lot of time in, in like tropical habitats and kind of vibe with that energy personally. Also, it's lower maintenance, truthfully. Right. And when uh, you have a store to run, you have to look at, you have to consider things like that. So in the video that I posted uh, on your, your shop eight months ago, <laughs> time is terrifying. <laughs> um, uh, we talked about the stands in the video as well. And yeah. before we move on to the, the work that you've done with Amazon, I wanted to talk a little bit about the stands that you have because they are in themselves like a really beautiful approach to presenting an aquarium. There's, there's a, a tension in them because they're supported only by two beams that makes them have their own like sense of art. So I was curious if you could just tell us where, what the story behind it is. Sure, yeah, thank you for the comments. Those are, that's awesome. Um, yeah, my stands, I would recommend always, if you're into art, uh, into the creative process, always look for opportunities where you're cross pollinating with maybe other people or other ideas. I took, yeah, I had a friend who was a wood, woodworker with absolutely no aquarium experience, and but he was very talented and he was really good at making something beautiful out of, out of simple, you know, simple uh, materials, mm -hmm. which was important. He obviously had a fairly low budget when I started this project. And um, so I told him my goal is we're going to use these just glass aquariums, rimless glass aquariums. And the goal is to really set them off to the best we could is like sort of like floating pedestals. We didn't want it, to, you know, a lot of stands feel really chunky and clunky and they're like kind of squeezing the aquarium and we wanted to just kind of set it off. And so he came up with this design and it's really nice. You basically have this, these, these shelves that are anchored um, with a dado uh, with these side beams mm -hmm. and, uh, and then a platform at the bottom and they're mounted into the wall. So it's fairly simple, but something you don't really see, I've never seen before. So they're quite innovative. I've had a lot of people copy them. <laughs> and uh, there one guy went so far as, cause I don't have it patented or anything. One guy went so far as he was ma going to mass produce them in Peru, and uh, I think that fell through. So I've, they've actually caused me a lot of grief. <laughs> just all the people trying to copy them, and and just oh man. So, anyways, but I I I've, yeah I love them. They're like I think they truly are art pieces. I can't take any credit for con the construction. That was a master woodworker who made them. We just went to Home Depot and we picked every single piece for its like quality and, you know, aesthetic value, the interesting grains. So it's very much a, a product of love. He was kind of a difficult guy. He's not watching this, so I can say <laughs> kind of a difficult guy. He's a gold miner. And uh, so he would just kind of get this, he would get this feel like he had to be out in the mountains and, you know, and go gold mining. And then I wouldn't see him for months with my project just hanging on the line waiting for him to finish it up so the stand <laughs> the stands are beautiful and i think they'll last forever now that i have them but 
they really delayed the opening of my store probably by like a year, honestly. Wow. So, wow. Um, yeah, it's double-edged sword at those stands for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are a couple questions in the chat, but before I, I engage with them, um, one of the things that I've all, A, I've, I've thought about copying this stand design as well, but uh, you know, I haven't gotten around to it, but I'm, I, I hope to rip you off one day. Um, <laughs> All right, but, for you, for you, I'll give you my blessing. Excellent. Um, <laughs> but when you're stacking tanks, you've left a certain amount of space in between them. Can you talk about yeah. like when you're trying to get your stance on in a small footprint, how much space to leave between them so that you don't make your life miserable? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't really. Um, I, I I honestly can't answer that. I I don't even remember what the spacing was like. We just did it. What's seemed right you know i mm -hmm. kind of stuck my arm in the aquarium in an aquarium and did some measurements and whatever that worked out to be um i could actually get that measurement for you though we could post it later but yeah. it has worked out whatever it was has it, we, it's never really in fear, interfered with our ability to catch things or move through the aquariums efficiently so it has worked out we have i don't think the image shows but there's three tanks stacked on each rack right Right. I mean, and, and on these, I believe the light is mounted on the tank itself. Yeah, right? I've changed that. We actually upgraded our lighting system during the shutdown. So we have them mounted above now. That's exactly so what I was less, thinking in, of. Less if, interference. Right. If I were to kind of mimic this, I would build a false rim so that you can hide all the lighting yeah. just behind it a little bit so that it just light is just kind of emerging from your setup. The but it sounds like you're you've beaten the to LED the punch. Just, yeah, the beauty of the LED systems, I just mounted those with um, some strong Velcro. Pretty yeah. Young. Cool. So, uh, question uh, from Mary: um, What is your favorite plant that you put in almost everything? My favorite plant. Yeah. Well, um, I would say you know, I, many years ago, I got an actual clone of the type of moss that Takashi Amano, my hero, uh, uses in his gallery. It came directly from him, from his gallery. Hmm. And so he calls it willow moss, Taxophyllum barbieri. It's like a finer version of, of, uh, of Java moss. So I kind of treasure that clone. I use it in everything. It's my, probably my favorite moss. So it'll, it'll just kind of cover things in a very delicate fashion. And uh, it's wonderful. So I use that a lot. You're not the first person that's mentioned an Amano off, yeah. off put of something. Um, oh, really? I, I, know, I know someone else that like their favorite, most treasured plant is uh, a bit of Java fern that they, they got from Amano yeah. um, that they propagated. Uh, probably but, some magic in there <laughs> right it's, it's a needle leaf java fern that oh, cool. is probably indistinguishable from yep. anything else but like because it has that story that it came from amana has since passed away it means it means a great deal um, yeah whatever inspires you whatever enriches your creative process i think is the important thing but uh, beyond the jo the willow moss java fern is is probably my next favorite i can't live without java fern the trident form, needle leaf forms, those are all beautiful ones. Have you, uh, MH Aquatics asked, do you ever find a way to include moss balls in your tanks? You know, I did an article for Amazon, I write for Amazonas Magazine occasionally, I'll put another Which plug is a in great magazine, people yeah. should uh, get it. I mean, YouTube is great, print publications is far better for actual factual information. <laughs> Um, and uh, they asked me to do a moss ball scape one time, and I did create, it was just like a one page simple article, and I did create a moss ball scape that I, I broke down quickly afterwards because it wasn't very sustainable. Moss hmm. balls are functionally like a ornament, you know, like a plastic toy in your aquarium. They're not really contributing to the whole ecosystem. That's something I really drive home with my customers is hmm. we're creating an ecosystem and we have to have different players in that process. They have to have different roles. Some are, need to grow fast to assimilate fish waste. Some, you know, need that work better with low CO2 requirements. All these, all these sorts of, we need to have a 
sort of stack up all these different um, plants with their various roles in the in the ecosystem that we're creating. So moss balls are don't do a whole lot, unfortunately. They're great. They're just kind of cute little fuzzy, you know, uh, look like little Star Trek, you know, creatures or something. I like them, but yeah, they're uh, like little tribbles. I, yeah, tribbles. That's what I was going for. Um, but they don't do a whole lot in terms of the ecosystem function. So you would need something to accompany them for more of a sustainable ecosystem. If you're not creating a sustainable ecosystem, that means you're going to be doing a lot of work yourself. And right. that's another thing I like to drive home. It's either dilution, doing a lot of water changes, mm -hmm. or assimilation in plant material. So you're either doing a lot of work yourself through water changes, diluting the waste that's building up in your little finite volume in your aquarium, or the plants are acting like in a, a filter and assimilating that waste into their growth and metabolism. So um, it's up to you what kind of ecosystem that you want to manage. So it's always important to to address those questions in the beginning. Right. So uh, the next thing that I want to move on to, um, Robert says needle and trident are his favorite plants, which I, yeah, I, th I actually think needle leaf or trident, they're both really solid. They're, they're my like go-to as well. Yeah, um, we're going to move on to the Amazon um, or okay. amazon.com. <laughs> um, now, which would you like to talk about first? Would you like to talk about the round tank or the wall? We'll talk about the wall. That was kind of an interesting story. Um, so, so we'll start with a photo. This is the wall in question. Um, and then we'll move on to a video. So tell us, tell us a little bit about that. So around the time when I was opening my store, I was trying to think of um, you know, display pieces for the store itself. And I was really captivated by Patrick Blanc's work. If you're not familiar with Patrick Blanc, he's mm -hmm. an artist who does vertical gardening. He'll, he'll create these beautiful like mosaics of plants on the, the mm -hmm. vertical facade of buildings. And he's, he's got quite a name for himself. He has a book called, um, I'm looking up in my bookshelf because I, I forget the, oh, The Vertical Garden. It's really worth checking out. Interesting guy. He started out as an aquarium person interested in cryptocorn that took him to southeast asia where he started noticing all these plants growing on these vertical surfaces and inspired this whole movement of vertical gardening so it's pretty common now but i wanted to create a vertical garden in my store and that was when you have a a, a living wall you you need a sump to to you have water recirculating through a matrix that the plants are attached to and i thought well why can't we use a fish tank as that sump and so I had a friend of mine manufacture the wall that would attach to like a 75 gallon tank above it. And so I created this little model um, of, of a, yeah, this uh, plant, this uh, vertical garden fish tank. About two weeks before I opened the store, I had everything dialed in, all the displays. I got a, a note from a friend, an old friend of mine who I knew from back in the day when I was really into poison dart frogs. He was also into poison dart frogs that he was working on this project. It's kind of a top secret thing. He'd been brought into Seattle and if he could come by my store, he heard I had I was gonna be opening a store soon. And mm -hmm. he came in, he was just blown away by what I was doing with the nature, because he had never seen a nature aquarium in person, never seen this living wall fish tank. Well, it turned out he was in charge of this Spears project for amazon.com. They're heavily invested in creating what they call biophilic architecture in their corporate office spaces that they were creating in downtown Seattle. And so he saw what I was doing, was blown away, and brought in the whole team of architects that were working on this project at um, Amazon. And um, that, was a, that was an amazing re moment of reinforcement because when you start a new business, you're just like, you have no idea if, if, you're succeed, if you're gonna succeed or not. You have no idea what your future looks like. It was very, obviously a lot of anxiety. So getting that kind of uh, push, that, that, um, that, that encouragement from Amazon, you know, this huge player was amazing for me. So they came in, they, they were inspired, and then they decided to replicate my little living wall in their main corporate space. So the first thing you see when you walk up the stairs, go through the turnstiles of their main building where like Jeff Bezos has his you know, office, it's actually a whole floor 
um, is a, an aquarium with a living wall backing it. It's 17 feet long, uh, about 500 gallons, and the whole system was created by the actual aquarium and, and uh, aquarium system was created by Tenji in California. They, they work with all public aquariums everywhere. Um, they come out of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, if you're familiar with that project. That's a really beautiful public aquarium. And they created the actual aquarium. The living wall was created by the fellow uh, Zach Zamora from Variance Design in, in Austin, Texas. He's done a lot of the Amazon work. So between myself, Tenji, and Zach, Variance Design, we came up with this thing. And then we brought Tom Barr in. Tom Barr is a well-known planted aquarium guru. Tom Barr into, uh, into the mix. And he helped with the design of the fertilization system, CO2 system. And then he did the initial hardscape even on this. And I, I was kind of Tom Barr's apprentice getting the aquarium set up. And then I took it over and did the maintenance and most of the aquascaping later on. Wow. So I mean, happily we've wrapped up that little intro with a little bit of the wide shots of the system. Um, I was able to visit this uh, same time I visited your shop um, a few days before was able to film um, without a tripod or anything. So I just kind of went very handheld. You can see in the footage, it's a little bit stabilized. Um, and it was such a, an impactful thing to walk in on. Now, the lights on the plant wall were already turned off for the night. So I, I missed seeing it as all one system. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about what, what thought went into like what plants and approach you, you took to the aquarium itself. But before you answer that, I wanna thank um, Mary. Mary uh, donated $10 to this live stream, which, and added for a future project, which I really appreciate. Um, so thank you so much to Mary. Um, so tell me a little bit about what the uh, intentionality behind what went into the aquascape. Well, for me, so, you know, most people, when they start getting into the business and they start doing maintenance projects and that kind of thing, they, they have small projects, maybe uh, an aquarium in a dentist's office or something. This was my very yeah. first maintenance job. It scared oh the gosh. crap out of me. Oh, Honestly, wow. I had a lot of sleepless nights about this aquarium and all the potential liabilities being uh, <laughs> in Amazon.com. But um so, but I went forward with it. And so I just chose plants that I knew were going to perform me. I knew right from the get go maintenance was an issue with these guys. You know, they didn't want to spend a lot of money uh, on maintenance costs. So I just went with, we just went with simple stuff, hair grass, uh, needle leaf java fern. There's like massive, you know, uh, football size clumps of needle leaf java fern. When I was doing maintenance, I don't maintain it anymore. I stopped working there at the end of 2018. I was pulling out two five gallon buckets a week of java fern, willow moss, the moss I like to use, uh, probably 200 cherry shrimp a week. It was amazing. It was like, a, it's the world's greatest farm tank. So it was dialed in perfectly by Tom Barr. The, the CO2 system is an interesting thing in its own right. It's a, it's a cylinder, fiberglass cylinder, or it's conical shape uh, uh, deal that they use, I guess, when um, they're, they're growing out fish in very high densities, they in actually inject pure oxygen hmm. into the tank to keep them in these real high densities. And so it's a diffuser built for oxygen and essentially is it's an enclosed chamber and the water's just pouring through the sides of this chamber. And as the bubbles of CO2 or oxygen um, enter, they're just getting sheared off and put into the, into concentration. So it holds the, the concentration of CO2 quite well because it's always a liability when using sump systems, you're going to off gas a lot of the CO2. So that right. was interesting in itself. And it's all on an apex controller, we have pH controllers. So you could just really dial it in perfectly and it has automatic dosing system and everything. So the plants were growing perfectly, Kessel lighting. And uh, so it's just like a plant growing machine. It's amazing. It's hard to imagine java fern, which you know grows quicker than I think people think, but doesn't grow that quickly, producing a five-gallon bucket of java fern a week. 
Yeah, That's I wild. mean, it's more of a scale issue. Just we have a lot of it, and so it's just going to multiply, you know, based on the ball, you know, the, just the biomass. Itself. Right. And then in the tank itself, uh, I believe, I, I don't remember if they're cardinals or neons, neon tetras. We um, started with cardinals and uh, cherry shrimp. They really wanted a, a shrimp tank, if you could believe it or not. That was, that was the defining, uh, that was the thing they wanted to build this whole ecosystem around, you know, which, you know, just like, what world am I living in? You know, get a gig with amazon.com. They want a giant cherry shrimp <laughs> tank, you know, it's so surreal. Um, and so, yeah, so I had to build it around cherry shrimp. So we couldn't put anything that was going to eat, eat them. And it was, it, they were really serious. You know, I felt a lot of pressure keeping those shrimp alive, <laughs> shrimp alive. Um, but that's because they saw a tank in my store that was crawling with little shrimps and right. boosa philandra. That was, that was the inspiration for the aquatic portion. We actually wanted to do a pure boost tank. And we started with a bunch of boosts, but it never really took off for some reason. Hmm. And, but the Java Fern did, so I quickly adapted. One thing about Amazon, they have a motto that it has to look like, um, what do they call it, like day five on day one. You know, it has to be dialed in from the get-go. So as I'm doing maintenance on the aquarium, it can never look like it's really just been totally, you know, uh, given a big haircut or something. I have to kind of have this, this is dancing with the aquascape more than anything where you're making changes, but you don't want them to look too severe. And like I said, it's right on the front lines of their main corporate space. And uh, so there's no like hiding it ever. So there's a lot of pressure, but I really, I really loved working with this tank because I would totally lose myself in the pro Like I would go out of my mind and just like, just come become one with this tank. It would take, it would take like five hours to trim it up and clean it up. Um, and I do that once a week and I'd often do it late at night. Um, Cause they kind of wanted me to work off scenes. Obviously, I was making a mess and whatnot. Sometimes <laughs> I would work during the day. Um, but it was a fast working on that kind of scale, you don't get to appreciate it on a smaller tank in the same level because you're literally hours and hours of this process, this repetitive and making these little creative decisions everywhere and feeling the pressure. And mm -hmm. it was like an out of body experience <laughs> for me. It was so crazy. Um, so I really enjoyed it. But on some level, I'm I'm glad I'm not doing that work anymore. It was very, very intense. Now, you we've talked earlier in the stream about the life cycle of an aquascape. This tank's been up operational for a while. How has it stayed? Well, like I said, when I when I left there, which was December of 2018, I kept pressuring them to reboot it because it was I was getting signs that it was not sustained sustainable much longer mm -hmm. you know you usually get these algae blooms that you can't control anymore that's that's usually when i start getting the signs it's time to start over and um we just our negotiations fell apart so i don't really know what their plans are what they're doing i have some of my customers work there and have told me they're just kind of let it's just not being trimmed much it's just like really overgrown so i right. can't tell i can't really tell you what their long-term plans are but for me, it was ready to be restarted for my, you know, what I'm comfortable with, with the aquascape. But like I said, we're mostly using very simple things. And there was a sort of, there's always a selection process over time. And what the delicate things died off, Java fern, the mosses, some of the boost stayed, some of the cryptocorns, those are pretty sustainable long-term. You know, you probably keep going and there's some tiger lotus in yeah, there. Yeah, the tiger lotus are the thing that's uh, kind of the eye catcher. Yeah, the me. tiger lotus was my that was my uh, the the focal point plant that I was using. But it was super jungly. But it was really fun. I would come in every week and be pretty overgrown. I just like you know just like this change of trying trying to create windows of negative space, trying to emphasize maybe a boost was looking particularly nice. You know, it was particularly purple or something trying mm -hmm. to emphasize that plant. Also, there's some underwater cameras in this tank that are projected on some screens in another part of the room. And so I'd have to think about, you know, the camera angles and things like that. So there, 
a lot of creative decisions going on all the time with this tank that were pretty unique, which um, yeah, the, the is... underwater cameras were a strange. Like I know I didn't ever saw them in the tank, but I saw the streams on on the wall. Like, what was the logic or intentionality behind that? Why did well, they want that? Well, so the um, working with architects is a pretty interesting experience, especially on this kind of level. They have architects who are like more like artists who come in and they add a layer of um, design elements th through the building. So we had these really creative folks that came to my shop and we were looking at the tanks and like, and they just got the idea of, of putting cameras into the tank. It'd be fun to kind of broadcast this underwater world. And it's kind of strange that we didn't make like um, live cams, you know, that people could watch follow yeah on the I, internet. I want to follow that I want to see as a technology company <laughs> but uh they didn't do that so but it was just one of those design elements for the architects to play with and it actually turned out to be kind of a liability because you know the cameras are underwater the i was only visiting this tank once a week mm -hmm. um and eventually they did hire someone full turn full time to kind of monitor things daily and so sometimes they would fog up and then you get this weird image and uh, fortunately we could we had some some canned footage that we could just broadcast if one of the cameras died or got covered in algae or something weird but it just it just added another layer of complication but another layer of interest i think um we're trying to make something go beyond just a, an aquarium we're trying to make an art piece truthfully and that was one of the things we came up with i i liked it it the some of the upper levels of management hated it because of the the logistical nightmares of keeping the, the cameras looking at interesting angles or whatnot. But right. I found it was a fun challenge. So for for folks that are just joining, uh, this tank is at Amazon headquarters. Um, and it's while you can barely see it there, there's a, a live wall growing up in the tank. And if you wanted to cr try to recreate that on a smaller scale. You've talked about how the water filters down through the live wall and into the aquarium. Yeah, how I will did, say. How did you build that? Well, I will say for this tank, they are separate systems. They're, the they're live separate. wall and the aquarium are separate systems. The one in my shop is the same system. Actually, going back to Amazonas, Aquar Amazonas Magazine, I did write an article on my live wall aquarium for them. So if you look through their archives, you could find it. It was probably like in 2012, 2013 or something. Um, I'm going to do that. Yeah. But we just, they wanted initially to tie in the wall with this aquarium. And I told them it would just be a maintenance nightmare. Really the plants, what I discovered is you get competition between the terrestrial plants and the aquatic plants. And the terrestrial mm -hmm. plants are much better at extracting the uh, nutrients than the aquatic plants are. And there's like a war going on between them. And uh, I find long-term, you'll the, the terrestrial plants will just win and um, you won't be able to grow too many interesting aquatic plants. That's, that was my discovery with my living wall. So we just wanted more control because this is such a high profile uh, installation. And so we, have, we elected to do two separate systems. Cool. So uh, I'm definitely going to look up that article because yeah. it's something that I've been like tinkering with with the 150 behind me of I, I left like about a foot between the wall and the tank in the hopes that maybe I could add a little bit of terrestrial something to surround it. So I might, I might hit you up on this. So for everyone that's at home, this footage, uh, it will eventually be a full length video and Back when I met with you a year ago, I actually shot an interview with you talking about the Amazon setup. Um, I don't even know if you remember doing that so long oh, yeah. ago. But good uh, memory, Alex. <laughs> so yeah, because I because I cracked open the footage this uh, this afternoon um, between when work ended and when this live stream started to frantically like edit everything together. I was like, oh, I do have audio of of all, all this description. All that's to say, there will be a like fully processed, color corrected version of this video up at some point. Um, so we'll we'll have it nice and documented because um, it'd be a shame to just have this footage live only on the live stream. But 
now we're going to transition to another setup, another setup that you guys have never seen before on this channel. Um, that also we're going to see footage for the first time. Now this footage is a little bit shakier, but uh, this tank is also at the Amazon Spheres, uh, and you you were responsible for that as well. So can you tell us a little bit about this tank? Yeah. So um, interesting enough. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com, one of the richest human beings ever to live yeah. in history, um, he does a lot of his computing in a greenhouse in his where he lives here, you know, nearby in Seattle. And he discovered it was just a great. He just found he was coming up with all sorts of creative ideas, working efficiently in this greenhouse space, and he had like carnivorous plants and all this stuff in there. And so he came up with the idea of having these big um, greenhouses that his employees could go in. It, it would be a function. It would be function as a workspace, not just like a hangout space. And go in and 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 you know kind of immerse themselves into surrounded by plants and water it sounds waterfalls and just this sort of immersive natural natural environment that we've created. And uh, so that was the idea is going to be the, the heart, they call it, of their corporate land, their corporate offices. Um, they, they bought, they basically took over this one section of downtown Seattle, knocked everything down, put up these big high rises. And they have elements of these really interesting um, biophilic design elements where they have, you know, living walls and rare plants. And he just wanted all the rarest plants. So we weren't going to use, you know, Home Depot garden variety house plants. We wanted like a true uh, botanical collection of interesting rare plants and maybe do some innovative stuff, try to grow things and propagate things that are impossible to do elsewhere. So that's the backstory. So they're, they have these, you know, high rises flanking this, these, they're called the spheres and they're basically these big bubbles um, that are multi-stories and in, inside and they have these this rainforest environment where people can do their office work, do their computing, but also be surrounded by this interesting architecture and all this nature. And after, I think that living wall aquarium that we created in the, the day one building, that was kind of the tester before the spheres broke ground. And just to show everyone what we were capable of doing, this sort of creative biophilic, you know, um, imaginings that, that we could do. In, for the next project, for the Spheres project. So luckily they liked my work for the day one aquarium, the living wall, and um, then hired me to, to do this, the Spheres aquarium. This, the, and that came about very organically, kind of almost at the last minute, it was really the last thing they added to the Spheres. That space was originally dedicated for seating for a little restaurant. And they mm. decided we're gonna ditch seating for the restaurant and put a big old fish tank there and have Steve do it. So I, I luckily inspired them to, to, to uh, add this, this environment in. And it was just a really interesting project. Like the height of the aquarium is actually based off my arm length, like how far I could get into the aquarium. So I feel very like, have this very personal relationship with this tank. It was again, custom built by Tenji in California. And- Yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious about like the, the tank itself because it's a three-sided tank with bowed sides on all three sides. Was there, like, did you have anything to do with the design of like the shape of the tank? And why are there curved sides? That seems so much more work, well, frankly. So initially they wanted a sphere. They wanted a big bu giant bubble aquarium. And we told them how difficult that would be. <laughs> they wanted a huge goldfish bowl, yeah. <laughs> And they nixed that idea, luckily. And so the architects, they, so they wanted, but they wanted some to harken back to some element of their sphere design. They're very proud of the, like the architecture of the actual sphere, it's spheres themselves. So they came up with this design where um, it's called a rail U triangle, I believe. But it's basically when you take three circles and they kind of intersect perfectly, it creates a, a rounded triangular shape almost mm -hmm. and that's what this is harkening back to and i guess it's a very classical um shape and architecture so they're kind of getting nerdy with the history of their field by creating the shape from from the top looking down it's the exact same 
shape as a guitar pick. So it's often called a guitar pick. And uh, I, I uh, initially was not super jazzed about it, but then when I saw it, I immediately got into it because it's essentially a roundabout. The fish are always in movement. They don't come into any real angles, actually. Mm -hmm. There are two, three angles, but it's so rounded that they're constantly in, move, in movement and they really don't even know they're in a fish tank. It's amazing. You can just see the behavior of them. They're very relaxed, very chill. Fish that might be shy elsewhere. They've actually bred um, the Terraphylum leopoldi, the leopoldi angel fish in this tank, which is not an easy fish to breed in captivity. And we have um, goldie plecos in there, sunshine plecos. And one of the goals was to get them up to size and breed them. When I talked to, I got to meet Bezos when they opened the spheres and he was captivated by this tank. He was just like, they had him on this little tour going through different stations of the spheres for the media. And then the paparazzi was following him. But when he got to the fish tank, you could tell he was genuinely interested and he spent the most time here and talking to me. So I actually got to meet Jeff Bezos and talk about tanks, talk about the tank and some of my, my reasonings for what I created for what I did. And, I talked about the Goldie Plecos being endangered in Brazil, how these hydroelectric uh, dam projects on the Xingu River were threatening them. So I put in a little plug for Amazonian conservation with the head of Amazon.com. I could tell he kind of bristled at that idea, <laughs> um, but uh, I did anyways. You know, it was my one chance to put some put in a word for the Amazon with Amazon.com. So I did, but yeah, it was. It, this was based on an aquarium. I also wrote an article called Amazon Reef for uh, Amazon's magazine. But the idea was to, um, since they put this aquarium, a lot of what I do, the, 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 um, how it's going to function are the, are the defining limiting factors. So when they, they put this aquarium kind of last minute, it didn't have floor drains. The nearest water source is like 100 feet away. So I Sounds knew we weren't going to be able to do a lot of water changes. Like the other aquarium we're looking at gets water changes twice daily on an automated system. It has a floor drain. It just dumps water down the drain. And it kind of is this machine that almost takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. This one was going to be way more labor intensive. And so I wanted to use all these emergent plants, you know, these terrestrial plants. I used a lot of philodendrons to act as this nutrient sponge. So as interesting of a concept, visual concept as this is, it's also extremely functional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever fish waste is being produced is being actively consumed by all these jungle plants, these terrestrial vines that are growing out of it. So that was, that was part of the reason. But it was really, I had created a smaller version of this years ago, wrote an article about it, you know, broke down the tank, shelved it. And then when I got this job, I brought that idea back because I knew it would be perfect for this application and they loved it. It fits in like a glove with the whole design, you know, all the plants in the space and their, their, um, their, their, you know, jungle style greenhouses. So it worked out really well. Yeah. I didn't realize that it was an afterthought having been there. It felt like it was supposed to be there the whole time. Yeah. It's fascinating when you get behind the scenes, these big projects, you realize it's just like any other project. People are just winging it, <laughs> flying by. Speak until thing. you make it. <laughs> exactly. That's it. So I was kind of shocked by that, but that's what happened here. And, uh, I, this to me is my masterpiece. Like maybe someday I'll create something cooler, but this is my, the fav my favorite thing that I ever got to do with the fish hmm. tanks. I create, I didn't, like I said, I'm a nature aquarium person, which means I'm not trying to replicate nature. I'm just trying to create the feel of nature. I do really feel like, you know, I've been to the Amazon many times. I do feel like I'm in a jungle when I'm in this, when I'm staring at this tank. I do feel the vibes from it. And uh, so I, I feel, I really feel like, and, it, and it's an easy, and it's very sustainable. It's been an easy tank to manage. It keeps looking nice, keeps growing. So I feel like I, I hit one out of the park with this and just that it like my, all my experience as an aquarium person, as a naturalist, as an artist kind of converged and I was able to bring this to life for, for an audience, for the pub, public, or at least for the amazon.com public. 
and it's a huge moment in my life, truthfully. Yeah, Robert S. asks, uh, so this isn't open to the public. I don't believe so. Uh, it's open only to Amazon employees. They, Basically, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, they, I think they allow you to, they allow the public to go maybe twice a month. You have to sign up in advance, they have tours. Yeah. If you have a friend who works at Amazon, which if you live in Seattle, almost everyone works for Amazon there now. So you, pr you probably could find a connection to get you in there. Yeah, basically for, for me, how I got this footage uh, was I was in Seattle. Um, actually, Custom Aquariums actually brought me out to Seattle. So I have a, a weirdly long relationship with Custom Aquariums and all the stuff in this live stream has to do with them. So thanks to them. Um, but uh, basically, uh, for the aquarium or AGA, uh, Aquatic Gardeners Association, has a bi-yearly meeting. Um, it's an incredible convention where a bunch of people that love aquatic plants get to hang out, which is such a super specific niche topic. And of course, we were in Seattle and we were able to take a small subset of that group on a tour of the Amazon spheres. Uh, and when we walked in, I just had my little camera, I was filming and I saw this tank and it was one of several stops that they took us on on their tour. And I was like, oh man, this is gonna be the most amazing thing in the world. And this is really the only aquarium in the spheres. There's one other smaller aquarium, but like this is the real aquarium in the setup. And the entire time I was like, can I just go back down there? I just wanna, <laughs> just wanna hang out with that aquarium. Why? Like, Terrestrial plants are great and all, but like I just want to film this aquarium for like the next two hours. Um, well, yeah, so. I will say, um, I think, you know, when judging from like Jeff Bezos' reaction, you just can't compete with, with you know, the movement of the aquarium. As cool as no. you have all these plantings, really beautiful, don't get me wrong, but yeah, you need you some life. You need some animal life to kind of engage people. So I think it was a really smart move to add this, actually. And, and, and it's not just the animal life. It's also because the water, there was there's strong currents. Yeah. The movement of the leaves also provides movement. That the incredible like 200 foot plant wall, it's extraordinary, but it's very static. It right. doesn't really move. Yeah, good point. Um, so on this tank, we're now looking at it as I frantically run around it. The the there's nothing coming and breaking that outer edge all the filtration is hidden. Can you talk about the design of how you managed to make it so that you can look at it from any angle and you don't see anything? Well, um, it's a pretty simple system. There's a central overflow. Uh, it's a sump system. So there's a sump below the, the tank and uh, there's a kind of island, central island, where the water flows out, goes down to the sump below and then is recharged into the aquarium after it's filtered. And so there's this plastic column in the middle. And the initial idea from the architects is they wanted to design a uh, artificial tree to mm. kind of come out of this and cover that thing. And they were going to spend a lot of money on fabricating a, um, a tree to cover it. So it was my job to find someone to create this artificial tree. I did find someone, and luckily they never called me back. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and so I reported back to the team that I couldn't find anyone to make this tree. And they actually came up with the lead for me, this, this person. And I said, but hey, I can do something better because I think the artificial tree would just break. It just wouldn't give the same feel as using, uh, using uh, natural elements like wood and stone and for a lot cheaper. And when you say cheaper in these projects, that's when everyone, uh, everyone's you know, ears perk up and they focus on, on what you're saying. So um, they were like, sure, whatever, go for it. And uh, so, you know, with the nature aquarium principle, we try to minimize the plasticky junk mm -hmm. that you associate with the aquarium in our designs. And I'm always guided by the nature aquarium with Takashi Amano, what I learned from Takashi Amano. And so we di I didn't really want any plastic stuff. Even if they could make this tree, I think it would detract from what I had, what my vision was. So I worked with Tom Barr again to, he not only is an aquascaper, but he also uh, collects manzanita wood in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Very, you know, 
it's kind of a dream working with Tom getting hardscape because he has the eyes of a highly skilled aquascaper and he's out in nature collecting, you know, wood for you. So I told him what I needed, um, what my, my ideas were. And he basically shipped me, you know, a few pallets of wood. Some of them were like full on trees. So I have like a tree in this thing as like a centerpiece and I'm anchored a lot of plants on that. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, our goal, my goal is just to cover up that central column, hide the filtration system the best. They really emphasize like they didn't want to see a single bit of plastic come through the center column. So I had that pressure, that design pressure. But um, yeah, the plants and the wood, there are some windows where you can see through. See, But I think it looks good because then you have a little negative space. But I was able to cover up that center column pretty easily just with the plantings, the wood, I used a lot of lava rock, big chunks of lava rock at the base. Mm -hmm. And um, but I remember when I was working on the hardscape, I was standing inside this empty tank, um, which I've never stood in a fish tank in my whole life. So that was kind <laughs> of a crazy experience. And one of my employees was handing me wood and I just had this like freak out moment. It's like, I'm building this hardscape in the, in middle of amazon.com it's very you know intense moments like you know that first placement of putting the wood down the rock down is just like it's so important to me i really like a very fluid um instinctive kind of process and for a minute there i just froze and i was like oh my god i don't think i can do this <laughs> and luckily you know the muscle memory came back and i put it together really quickly and it looked nice and i was happy with it but um yeah, just high pressure aquascaping. I recommend it for everyone. <laughs> you will discover like the depths of your own soul. <laughs> yeah, why not take the most calming thing you can do and make it the most stressful thing you can do? Yeah, it's not stressful at all for the person managing. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not calming or peaceful for the person managing it or uh, designing it. It's actually driving them into the insane asylum. No, it's not that bad. It was it was super fun, but yeah. It's good to be pressured because if you're pressured, you grow. You know that's how everything evolves uh, by stress. So you can't you can't hope for a stress-free existence and grow as a human being, grow as an artist. Right. And now you uh, you mentioned earlier that there were angels that were successfully bred in this system. Can you talk a little bit about what what you did to try to create a habitat for the fish, not just an aesthetically pleasing? Yeah, I think um, what I've learned by studying nature is um, woody debris, the downed wood, you know, down trees, down uh, tree matter, branches, twigs, whatever. I used to do salmon habitat restoration when I was younger, and that's what we were always trying to preserve in the habitats where baby salmon were growing, where the adult salmon were spawning where these wood structures is extremely important um, for keeping, sorry, my foot's falling asleep here, um, for keeping these ecosystems healthy and viable uh, as nurseries for these endangered salmon we're working with. So that's really where my background is in e ecology. So luckily I have the background as an ecolog ecologist, environmental, as an environmental studies student in college. And so I knew if we had a lot of wood, the fish would behave as if they're in nature, they would act very um, relaxed. And so that was part of the process, you know, besides just the aesthetic value was just, that's what I love about aquariums. You know, you're creating, or aquascaping, you're creating art, but you're also creating a functioning biological ecosystem. It's a perfect blending right. of art and science in one thing. It's very rare, you know, to, I don't, I mean, we should really be celebrating our, our art form a lot more because we're doing something so innovative that can really inspire people to appreciate uh, our earth really, you know, because we're creating beauty with natural elements. We're not just painting pictures or writing songs. We're working with living things, natural elements. And uh, we, we need to like, you know, kind of pump up our own artistic ego a little bit <laughs> and not I feel agree. like a, aquarium nerds or something. We're, we're, we're great artists in our own right. And so, it's very transient. Yes. It's something that like it changes every yeah every few days, every week. It's a different system, and at some point, it no longer exists. Aquariums have life cycles, 
So it's art, but it's a very, very temporal form yeah, it's, of art. It's, it's dynamic, you know, there's so much energy, there's so much movement, there's so much life happening. And the, and you're dancing with that as the, the creator, the, or man, you know, it really comes down to maintenance. And uh, so managing that dance is, is really where it's at. It's really fun. Yeah. So I'm going to take us back to your shop. And um, as we kind of wrap up, can you remind everyone where Aquarium Zen is, how they can get in contact with you? Yeah. So Aquarium Zen is 920 Northeast 64th Street in Seattle, Washington. We're actually in the city. We're in the north end of the city near the University District. And uh, you could go to my website, aquariumzen.net. That's, you know, that'll give you the basic logistics, how to find us, what our store is all about. But if you really want to stay in touch with the pulse of what's happening in the store, you want to go to my Instagram page. It's just at aquariumzen, one word. I will uh, pop that into the chat one final time. Um, yeah, so, and tomorrow night you're going to be doing a live stream, correct? Can we, uh, yeah, I'll be doing an Instagram that? live stream at 8 o'clock Seattle time. I've been doing those two to three times a week during the quarantine time just to, for me to, you know, interact, continue to maintain connections with my customers. And it's been an interesting experience also trying this new medium for me. Yeah, so if you enjoyed this stream, um, and looks like plenty of you did, uh, I hope that you go check out uh, aquariums and on Instagram and follow along on the next live stream. Um, so uh, Aqua Balls, that's a, that's a name, um, says, gonna make me drive there soon. Yeah, I hope that you guys do visit Aquariums and it's an incredible shop. I mean, not just the aquariums, but the whole aesthetic of the shop is really, really relaxing. Like the, it lives up to the name of Aquarium Sin. So. Yeah, it has a very peaceful vibe for sure. Yeah, so I want to thank you so much for joining us. My um, pleasure. And I hope that we can uh, do this again sometime when there's a little bit less of the constraint to stay indoors. Maybe we can do it from aquariums at some point and we can give everyone a tour of it and remind everyone that uh, they should visit your shop. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. All right. Well, thanks so much. Bye.